Well, welcome everybody. And uh, this is the third in a series that we're doing of five webinars uh, jointly by M. Bode with Adi Kapoor uh, and myself uh, and Carolyn Kitto, who are the, the uh, national co-directors of Be Slavery Free. So it is really good to uh, have everybody here and to, um, uh, to see how many are coming on for this. And uh, uh, let me tell you, we have had uh, a tremendous amount of uh, people who have uh, downloaded the different uh, sessions that we have had so far, and um, uh, people have been using uh, everything from schools to business to, uh, uh, to um, companies, uh, and uh, that's been very exciting uh, to see. One of the things that we have been uh, finding on this is that uh, people have been starting bit by bit to start to understand what it means to uh, um, uh, to uh, understand child labour and the complexities of it, and uh, that therefore the ways forward, which we don't want to rush into, but we want to do that together as much as possible. Uh, where we are uh, is in Sydney, and people are uh, viewing this from all over the world. So what we say is that part of our tradition is that we want to give respect to the uh, indigenous people where we are. We are in the land of the Durag people of the Eora nation, and we give respect to uh, the elders and leaders past and present and emerging. So tonight we're going to be looking at uh, the, the whole area of remediation. And uh, this is going to be a very, very interesting one. The speakers that we have, uh, and always as Artie introduces things, we hope there's going to be a chance to really gather some more insights into what's happening and, uh, and what's going on there. So uh, let me hand over to Artie Kapoor, who is the CEO and founder of Embode. And Artie, as usual, it is always so good to be able to do this together. Thank you, Fuzz. Thank you, Fuzz. This is absolutely wonderful. Um, it's the third uh, webinar in our series, Are We There Yet? on child labor. And we're really pleased to be collaborating with Be Slavery Free, um, and in particular to work with you, Fuzz and Carolyn. Um, we used the first, we uh, first introduced the concepts and the background and the complexity of child labor in our first webinar. Um, and in the second webinar, we had some speakers that joined us and we looked at some of the root causes of child labor. And in this webinar, we're going to be looking at remediation. Um, we are really, really um, looking forward to hearing from the panelists uh, today. And the aim uh, of the series, and including uh, this one, is to, show, is to show and share concepts and experiences um, of how we can respond to child labor. And this one in particular on remediation is of really important, of great relevance and importance right now. Um, you know, historically, when we've been looking at responding to child labor and eradicating child labor around the world, um, you know, we're always thinking about governments. And in fact, according to the law, international law and obligations, the main stakeholders to respond and eradicate child labor are governments. They are the main uh, mandate holders. And what do we really understand about remediation? Um, remediation you know, is really about the act of re remedying a situation where something has been damaged. Um, and in, in the case of human rights violations, remediation is about restoring the human beings, in this case, children, um, to the best way possible to their original um, and full potential as children. Um, in order to really respond and remediate child labor around the world, um, one of the, um, there's different steps that we really need to take. One is about identifying children who are actually in the situation of child labor at any given time, um, and, uh, and, then, and then making sure that they come out of their child labor situation. But also it's important to monitor the situation of at-risk children. 
Um, in the first and the second webinars, you know, we looked at um, some of the root causes and risk factors around um, child labor. So it's not just about identifying children who are already in child labor situations, but also about reducing vulnerability of children before and even after they're um, in child labor situations from continuing in that mode. And so when we're talking about remediation, we're talking about identification, monitoring, and then the application of certain interventions around the child and to the child um, about how they can you know, get back into school or how they might be able to uh, get back to their original um, status and situation, get out of exploitative, exploitative situation or a hazardous situation and get back, back, get back to being safe and cared for um, so that they can live their full potential um, as children. And part of remediation is also moving on to safeguarding and prevention. Um, as I mentioned, historically, the onus has been on governments to respond to child labor. And what we've been seeing in the last 10 or so years is an increasing awareness and understanding of the role of businesses. Businesses have always been responsible for ensuring that they don't employ children or underage um, children in their, in their businesses. Um, but what larger multinational corporates are being called uh, to take up responsibility for now is also about ensuring that there is no child labor in their supply chains. So this actually extends to you know, different countries, whole chains of supply of commodities from cotton to cocoa to other raw materials, um, from fields and farms to factories, refineries, mills. So we're really talking about quite a, a large amount of responsibility onus, shared accountability to be taken by businesses, governments, and communities. So today, we're going to be looking at um, a couple of different approaches. We're going to be looking at how, um, how to approach child labor, how to remediate child labor, how to identify, how to monitor, and how to apply remediation measures and remedies to children along a supply chain. And it could be across a particular commodity, We'll be hearing from the cocoa sector. We'll also be looking at an example from um, shoemaking. Um, and also another approach would be looking at particular areas. So communities, um, starting from a geographical area, um, how do we eradicate child labor in a, a geographical area? Or how do we eradicate child labor in a whole supply chain? So these are two, not, not really two different approaches, but two sides of the same coin. Um, and we're hoping to unpack some of the concepts and experiences from our eminent speakers. So without much further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, who is um, Sarah Dekic. Uh, she is the Director of Policy and Partnerships at the International Cocoa Initiative, ICI, which is a leading multi-stakeholder foundation whose mission is to advance the elimination of child labor and forced labor in the cocoa sector. In this role, Sarah is, among others, responsible for leading ICI's stakeholder relations, including members, partners, donors, and policymakers. Specialized in business and human rights, Sarah has over 10 years of experience working with businesses, the EU, and, institution, and international institutions, as well as civil society. She holds a French-German double diploma from the Institut d'études politiques de Lille in France, and Westfalish Wilhelms University of Munster in Germany, as well as an executive MBA from the Villeric Business School in Brussels. Welcome, Sarah. Um, happy for you to start your presentation now, and I'll have a little bit of some questions for you later. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um very much and thank you for this biography <laughs> which is uh, always funny to hear um do you see the presentation correctly and can you hear me correctly yes right yes perfect okay 
Good, well, and good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world. Indeed, it's a very international crowd today, I understand. It's noon for us in Geneva, so you are my lunch treat. Um, and as Arti said, indeed, uh, my name is Sarah Dekish. Uh, I'm uh, Director of Policy and Partnerships at the International Cocoa Initiative, ICI, and my input today will be indeed more specifically on a, on a commodity, a product, which is uh, cocoa. So we'll focus on child labor in the cocoa sector. Uh, first of all, what is child labor? And um, you might have heard that indeed from the previous uh, sessions, I thought that I'll still share a word about it, maybe also for those uh, today who were not uh, part of these first webinars. Well, not all work done by children is child labor. And the International Labor Organization, the ILO, defines child labor as work that deprives children of their dignity. Um, Artie mentioned that, and that is harmful to physical and mental development. So as such a young person aged above the minimum working age, undertaking non-hazardous light tasks and during limited hours, which do not interfere with schooling, is considered as acceptable work. The country is indeed child labor. And across the world, there are 160 million children involved in child labor, and unfortunately, Child labor is an agricultural issue in many countries and the cocoa sector, which is the focus today for me is not immune to child labor. So about 1.56 million children are in child labor in both Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana, which are the two major uh, cocoa producing countries. About 70% of the world's cocoa production originates from these two countries and over 60% of their production is exported to the EU. A study conducted by the National Opinion Research Center, NORC, at the University of Chicago during 2018-2019 shows that almost all children uh, working in child labor in the cocoa sector in Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana live at home with their parents. So they work on smallholder farms, helping with the household ordinary activities. So in most cases, child labor is not as such the result of an intentional exploitative situation. And I think that's important to understand. It's really very um, focused on, on, on helping families out. And almost half of the children aged five to 17 years living in cocoa growing areas do some work of cocoa related child labor. And, and maybe surprisingly, most of them go to school. In fact, school attendance has increased in both Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana over the past 10 years. However, that does not mean that school attendance is regular, nor that they have good results, but still I think something relevant to mention. And on aggregate, children working in Cocoa work an average of 8.3 hours a week, which is uh, less than also 10, 10 years ago. So here we are talking about 8.0 hours a week. The study also shows that in fact, the main problem lies in the nature of the work that children undertake um, with 95% of, of child labor being documented as being hazardous. So more specifically, um, a large majority of them use sharp tools, carry heavy loads, are exposed to agrochemicals, for example, or have also wounds and cuts on their, on their skin. So why is that? Uh, well, child labor has multiple root causes, and I think that's also something that was uh, mentioned earlier. Poverty, of course, and child labor is deeply rooted in structural poverty. So we understand child labor as both a symptom and a self-perpetuating cause of poverty. Limited access to quality education is another root cause, even if the situation has improved. A study that we have conducted indicates, for example, that in Côte d'Ivoire, child labor is 66% lower in communities with the highest quality education. Gender inequality, another study that we have conducted and other researchers, I think, come to similar conclusions, indicates a gender dimension to child labor, with child labor being slightly higher when the female parent is illiterate. And finally, another infrastructural, or well, finally, other infrastructural problems also lead to child labor, such as lack of birth um, certificates, and the birth certificate is a proof of legal identity, and proof of age is needed to prevent underage recruitment, but also to access um, healthcare services, education, justice, etc. However, 40 to 50% of births in cocoa growing regions in Côte d'Ivoire, for example, are not registered, according to UNICEF. So child labor is a real challenge, and it's a very complex uh, one. 
So what are we at ICI doing to tackle this, prog uh, this problem? Um, the work we are carrying out together with our members and partners um, is characterized by two type of approaches. So indeed a supply chain based approach and the community development approach. Now, what does that mean uh, concretely? Um, the supply chain based approach. So in 2012, ICI developed the Child Labor Monitoring and Remediation System or CLMRS. Not sure the acronym makes it more easy to pronounce, but I hope you will follow me. Um, at the time, it was developed uh, on demand from Nestle. And since then, it has been implemented and replicated within Cocoa supply chains in West Africa by almost all, or if not all, big chocolate and cocoa companies, and increasingly also smaller traders. A CLMRS is a system which objective is to identify, prevent, address, and remediate child labor, and which is really embedded in the supply chain of, of companies. So how does it work? It's based on the presence of facilitator, which can be uh, lead farmers or company trainers, depending on the model that, um, that the company chooses to do, within the cocoa growing communities and these persons raise awareness on the issue of child labor they actively monitor households and farms and collect the data on the situation of the child on, of the children all data is collected via smartphones and gathered on databases from which systemic analysis can be conducted and therefore remediation strategies defined and this is done together with within the community with the local stakeholders and also governmental uh, organizations agencies and all identified cases of child labor are followed up repeatedly regularly to determine whether remediation has successfully reduced the exposure of the child to child labor and taken out of child labor ultimately and it's also a way for us to continuously improve uh, the system uh, and make sure that um, that it leads to to effective results. So an effective CLMRS must be able to do training and awareness raising, identify cases of child labor, offer targeted support for for both prevention and remediation at individual household and community level and follow up children over time. And from these characteristics, you might recognize uh, the UN guiding principles, human rights, due diligence requirements or those of the OECD. So these international frameworks, which indeed require a company to identify, uh, monitor, address and remediate human rights harms, human rights violations of which of course child labor is, is part of. So to create a level playing field, a concept which everyone likes to use, sector-wide alignment of those processes uh, is needed. And, and this is what the CMS uh, uh, um, helps to do. But the CLMRS alone cannot address all the dimensions of child labor, which are complex, uh, as we saw earlier. So other complementary and mutually reinforcing efforts are required uh, to tackle child labor holistically and to address also the socioeconomic pressures and root causes that are associated to it. And this is where community development approaches come in. So a community development approach brings communities to together and helps them to play an active role in implementing child-centered uh, development um, activities. Um, so as a first step, a communi the community's needs are assessed and priorities are also assessed in discussion with community members, also farmers, uh, families, children, village leaders, etc. And this is usually done through community child protection committees. Um, on this basis, action plans are defined and together with the community remediation uh, measures are developed alongside local and district authorities and civil society uh, partners, um, etc. So really to make sure that the community can put in place the necessary measures based on what they have identified as needed to support the children. This approach can be run by its own or blended with a CLMRS. So when done in combination of a CLMRS and especially on the prevention and remediation dimensions, the two uh, come together or overlap, we call it a dual approach. And actually with some of our members and partners, we um, apply this dual approach. Um, 
so what type of measures prevention and remediations are being implemented uh, through a community-based or a, a, a CLMRS-based uh, approach? So there are different kinds of measures that can be implemented. Usually they come back to the, the same kind of activities, which I've tried to summarize here in, in these four blocks. So it's about supporting farmer livelihoods. So our work with farmers focuses on supporting them to diversify their income so we help farming families to set up alternative income generating activities including other agricultural crops or small businesses for example it's also about education and especially quality education so supporting communities uh, to create good school environments for the children by uh, constructing or renovating facilities uh, by providing school kits, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, working on vocational training. It's also about gender empowerment. So many of the activities implement can benefit and should be benefiting women um, because they play an, an important role in in uh, in also making sure that the child, the children are protected. And you see some measures there and child protection. In general, I mentioned birth certificates and there are other specific measures that can be really implemented to support the children in its right. And here in a community development approach, community child protection committees play an important role. What does that lead to? Um, so results from ICI supported CLMRS between 2015 and 2020 indicate a number of prevention remediation measures that have been provided. So this is taken from our annual report and you're welcome to, to have a look at it and, and read further. So you see that over 150,000 children received remediation and prevention measures and supporting measures. You see here the number of um, activities that were deployed. So over 36,000 school kits uh, were given to children, um, the, uh, over 5,000 um, annual registrations to a formal school were achieved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And overall, of those children identified in child labor, 34% were not in child labor at the two most recent follow-up visits, and 50% were not in child labor at the most recent uh, follow-up visit if I'm trying to summarize it all in very short. And this is from those uh, CLMRS um, approaches or measures, um, supporting measures that were directly implemented by C uh, ICI with our members and partners. In parallel, our three-year community development program resulted in a reduction of about 20% of child labor in the communities assisted. And in fact, if we look at these two results, they are quite in line with another study that was commissioned to NORC at the University of Chicago, which assessed the impact that community development and supply chain uh, based approaches have implemented by companies have and the study concluded that um, these two approaches combined have led to a one third reduction in the prevalence rate of hazardous child labor in cocoa production so a one third reduction in in fact a relatively short period of time so one can assume that if we continue those efforts in a consistent and regular uh, manner, actually we can achieve a lot. However, at the same time, we know that the sector's biggest challenge today, and therefore also our priority at ICI, is upscaling. Uh, um, and it's really the upscaling of effective action to cover all children at risk of child labor. And we are convinced that to achieve sector-wide change, that requires to shift from an individual ad hoc project based uh, approach to a broader nationally coordinated systems approach. And that requires alignment and coordination of efforts through an area based lens, of course, so ensuring that efforts are targeted to address all forms of child labor in all livelihood sectors and also alignment and integration of child labor monitoring and remediation systems with wider local and national child protection and social protection systems so at national level. And achieving sector-wide change, therefore, uh, requires to develop common tools, shared metrics, in order to advance accountability and transparency across the sector, which is also more and more needed 
in order to respond to the increased uh, voluntary and I would say regulatory framework that, that is out there. So with this upscaling imperative in mind, our strategic focus at ICI for the next five years um, as a multi-stakeholder organization therefore consists in three elements. A, supply so responsible supply chain so continuing to focus on responsible supply chains where systems and services which i mentioned earlier that responsibly and transparently prevent and remediate child labor are strengthened and aligned B, working with uh, within a supportive enabling environment where national and international policies are conducive to change and three that has all to be part of an integrated and coordinated approaches and to achieve mm. this three uh, things are required, innovation and learning. So continuously learn from what is working well, developing common metrics and tools, as I mentioned, also capacity and system strengthening. So identifying critical mm -hmm. gaps and solving these gaps and technical advocacy, which is about continuous um, sharing of, of good practices, knowledge sharing, and also alignment of resources across the sector. And with that, I am. Um, Thank you. Um, and I'm happy to take additional questions. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. That's wonderful. You've um, said uh, you've given us such a fantastic and detailed overview in um, just just a few minutes. And I wish wish we had more time to go into more depth. One of the things I wanted to ask right at the outset is that you know ICI focuses on the cocoa sector, and of course we have commodities all kinds of commodities, agricultural and otherwise, all around the world where we have this issue of, of child labor. And with the cocoa sector, what we've seen in the chocolate and cocoa sector is a huge amount of investment by chocolate and cocoa companies um, into monitoring supply chains. Um, but in a lot of other, including within the cocoa sector, but it also within other, ad, other agricultural sectors, you don't have that level of, you don't have that power of so much investment into the supply chain approach, the numbers that you have given, the impact that you have made, you know, the, the numbers are, are staggering. Um, and yet I also understand that it's actually taken quite a lot of financial investment. Um, you know, what, how do you do this without all of the investment from companies? Because not all, all of the business sector and across other commodities would be able to invest into supply chain monitoring and evaluate, uh, you know, child labor monitoring and remediation systems like you're doing with ICI. It's just not possible in other, in other agricultural commodities. What, what did you, what do you have to comment and say about that? How would you work um, on CLMRS or other monitoring systems across the supply chain without that financial investment? Uh, well, I think financial investment in, is needed in any case. Um, that's first of all, and what we see, um, and, and that's actually also part of our, one of our objectives is, of course, also creating alignment or um, helping to replicate the model also for other commodities. And what we also do in certain cases where some producers also grow other crops, for, for example, coffee, is that the system can also cover both. So it's not so that the investment in Indeed, indeed, also uh, serves other other sectors and other uh, areas. That's that's uh, one thing. And, and another element. Uh, I'm not sure whether that is going to answer um, the question, but. Um, you said it also earlier, there, it's a shared responsibility. So of course, companies have a responsibility to respect human rights across their supply chain. So that requires a certain shift in the way they operate and indeed being able to understand where issues are in order to address them requires a certain level of investments. And it's also the duty of the state to um, protect uh, human rights. So, mm -hmm. and if we see that, Overall, or ultimately, if um, um, indeed we don't focus necessarily on one kind of measure, but we are able to um, target different kind of measures, I, as I tried to illustrate, which are uh, complementary, then we will be able to cover um, mm. more geographies and more, more sectors. But indeed, for that, it is indeed important to not only have a very narrow um, view, yes. but to be able to um, trying to play with different different approaches and also cover mm. other 
um, other sectors and allowing other sectors or other areas to learn from what is working well. Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, one of the dilemmas we really do have in a lot of sectors is, you know, what do you do when companies cannot uh, invest so much into the broader remediation measures that are needed um, across the supply chain, um, mm. you know, especially in commodities in areas where, you know, the government has very low capacity or doesn't have the will or a lot of the other indicators, development indicators are very low. So, and perhaps um, we can come back to you, Sarah, mm -hmm. there's some questions in the chat box, which uh, are for you. You might like to answer them as well with Carolyn. Uh, mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Um, and please carry on asking questions to Sarah, everybody. Um, and we'll have hopefully have a few minutes at the end. If not, they'll be answered in the chat box. So I'd like to uh, introduce our um, next speaker, Dr. Shanta, uh, Dr. Shanta Sinha, um, is the founder secretary of MV Foundation, which is an India-based organization dedicated to the abolition of child labor and, may, and the mainstreaming of formal schooling for children. Um, now, MVV, MV Foundation is known for its non-negotiable principles and, abol and abolition, abolition or abolishing, I should say, all forms of child labor and ensuring that every, uh, ensuring every child's right to education. Um, Dr. Shanta Sinha has headed the National Commission for the Protection of Child Rights for the Government of India and is its first chairperson for two consecutive terms from 2007 to 2018. She also served as a professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Hyderabad, and she is a recipient of the very prestigious uh, Ramon Magyasai Award for Community Leadership, and of course, the incredibly prestigious Padma Shiri uh, Award by the Government of India. She will, she'll be joined um, in responding uh, to her questions by her colleague, um, Mr. Venkat Reddy, who's the national convener a convener for MV Foundation as well. So without much further ado, Dr. Shanta Sinha, if you'd like to uh, start, bring up your presentation, uh, and we're eager to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, share. Okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, and uh, for this opportunity, and thank you, Sarah. Uh, each time I hear you, I learn new things from your presentation. Uh, what I will do is uh, talk to you about MV Foundation most, and more specifically about our work in Agra uh, and uh, uh, also look at the remediation that uh, we have as a strategy for uh, ensuring that uh, there is no child labor at all in an area. Now, we have, uh, in fact, uh, it's an old uh, NGO. We started in 1991. We started with three uh, villages, uh, withdrawing 30 children who were uh, forced labor in agriculture. The, at the moment, I mean, we must have uh, withdrawn over 1 million children from work. And in our peak capacity, we were working in about 8,000 villages. So I think it is the model that allows it to expand and to replicate and to take this. Uh, but what we have learned in this process, I mean, that is what I would like to emphasize on, is that it requires everybody's energy to get children to school, which means it requires the government, it requires a community, it requires the businesses, it requires all of us to come together. And there are no overlap or roles. What the government can do, community must not. What the community can do, government must not. Not must not. I mean, what the community can do should do that and not substitute to the government. What the businesses can do, neither the government nor the community can. So we will have to look at defining the roles of our stakeholders. These are the important stakeholders, the government, the community and the businesses, and ensure that we play our uh, roles in a manner that children are all brought back to school. As uh, Arti had mentioned, our interventions are based on the non-negotiable principle that we address every child out of school. 
you know, and that there has to be no excuse for a child to remain out of work, that we cannot give uh, causes for child labor. We will have, although there are multiple causes for child labor, here we are looking for solutions on how to get them out of work in spite of these causes. So the question, how becomes more important and the question why. So we address them out of all children out of school, not distinguish between those who are in child labor and child work, no distinction between hazardous and non-hazardous, because we feel that this distinction is really going against girls and their work. Their work gets totally invisibilized once we start defining uh, the uh, child labor as different from child work, because most of the work that girls do fall in the category of child work. So we feel that if a child is out of school, that child must be uh, uh, defined as child laborer, and we have to take a strong position that they must go to formal mainstream uh, main schools and not a night school, not an evening class, not a half big school, but a full time school. And we feel that is possible due to change in norms, more of it later, and also that by changing norms in a particular area and winning over everybody in the process. Let me come back to the original statement that we withdrew a million children from work, which meant we, would, we resolved a million tensions. No child's journey to school is soft. Uh, it is a process of resolving tensions, and it is only in the process of resolving tensions that we create a consensus, we change the norms in favor of children. So this is not a soft program. Getting a child labor into school is a hard program and a process of resolving tensions. To go to the next slide, I, I thought I'd quickly go into uh, the work that we did in Agra. The, uh, there was a study made by uh, a Center for Research and Multinational Corporations. SOMO is the uh, you know, uh, acronym. Stop Child Labor uh, Campaign and Fair Labor Association, where they found that there's a concentration of children in the shoe industry, some hundreds and thousands of children working there. And based on that, they approached MB Foundation because they found that it fits so well. The strategy they had in mind fit well into what we were doing. And uh, the concept is really in an area-based approach. Uh, where all children in a geographical area, in fact, the geographical area that coincides with an administrative unit, political administrative unit, it's not just geography, but it has to coincide with that administrative unit, uh, is selected. And we made the selection based on the concentration of children engaged in shoe industry. We work on ensuring that all these children who, uh, who are out of school get into the school system and also follow with the children in school system. We believe that the schools have no capacity to retain children from the first generation learner. In fact, they're not sensitive to the poor or marginalized uh, communities. And so there's a risk of them dropping out of school. So we, our area-based approach talks about all children out of school into school and also follow up of children in schools just so that they don't drop out. And uh, in the process, we engage with uh, many stakeholders. I'll come to that later. And I'll, I'll uh, talk about the st stakeholders and then go to the impact. Now, here the model has uh, first thing, identifying children, uh, tracking them, and establishing processes, community processes of tracking every child. No child has to be left behind. And then constantly contacting the parents, contacting uh, uh, other stakeholders to support the child get out of work. Once a child gets out of work, establishing bridge courses. Uh, this is a, we had established non-residential bridge courses in Agra, but if possible, it would work, it would be more effective if these were residential bridge courses. Simultaneously, we engage with the companies in a manner that they are associated with the program from day one. Initially, these are the local uh, uh, representatives of the company, the subcontractors and uh, the smaller agents. 
and as we go along we keep meeting the higher ups till we meet the global level management and the business corporations make them part of the program own up the program get them to support in terms of school kids uh, uniform or even giving public statements that they will not engage children in their supply chain a lot of campaign and advocacy there is uh, and also in the process we establish a social norm that that no child in that area would work and a pride of the community that in our area no child goes to work in fact there are small bo uh, boards that are set up uh, put up on grocery stores everywhere saying our store is child labor free our house is child labor free our locality is child labor free so in a way a sense of ownership and a pride in the matter the impact of the model i think the four there were four uh, major international footwear brands bata aster muller dykwood and uh, elcor in uh, the impact is that whereas in the beginning we were funded by an external donor by the time we were in the second uh, year of the program they took over funding of major components of the program and there were many children who could in fact see the link between them and pata or them and uh, shoe company otherwise many of them didn't know whom they were working for they knew they were doing shoes but that there were multinational corporations involved that link was established and even the companies could know which company was working in which area so that kind of a link was very very important it was a sense of personal touch in this each company subsequently had its social compliance units so we set up certain compliance units on not having child labor uh, and at every level uh, you know and this is with reference not only to child labor but then if children were replaced by home workers by women to see that their standards of minimum global standards are maintained the wages are maintained and uh, that they get all the benefits of being in an informal sector once this pilot started coming and started uh, blossoming they start the company started sharing it with their other uh, others i mean that was the stage at which we were and uh, we could get about 1200 out of school children identified 1118 of them were involved in shoe industry and they have all been sent to school through the bridge courses the key to the program is the trained mobilizer i think this is not often mentioned but these are the grassroots level field staff who do the multiple uh, operations of talking to functionaries of talking to the schools talking to the parents and who resolve conflicts and who are planning for every child they, like in this program they had these are the field level mobilizers who made 1000 plans they are the uh, implementers they are the planners they, they are the ones who monitor they carry out all the functions of the program in their head and they are the moral spokesmen they are the conscience keepers i think we will have to emphasize the role of this uh, field level staff without them i'm sure it is very very difficult to run a program mm. of this uh, nature the so just um, holders uh, are uh, uh, employers I'll write just have protection to... forums. You and the parents. I will not go into that. The remediation methods would be, uh, as I mentioned, the residential uh, bridge course, integrating them into formal schools, as it was mentioned even in the uh, uh, Sarah. The uh, documentation of birth certificates. These are very very important. And in strengthening the system, putting pressure on the system to invest more in education in fact they should be running the bridge courses and we got the government to run the bridge courses and not the donor agency and it is certainly scalable because you prevent child labor uh, you get uh, uh, i mean you establish a social norm and one can actually withdraw from the area because uh, the community has taken it over and this can become a demonstration site i might just mention unfortunately due to covid while we were in the peak of our activities in the area we had to sort of slow down and uh, i think there are new challenges which can be discussed later but uh, one will have to confront those new challenges 
where perhaps in some instances there is a reversal that is happening in the case of child labor. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Shantasena. I wish that we had so much more time. I have so many questions. One question I just wanted uh, to really delve deeper in is that, um, you know, one of the things I've heard you say uh, is that the definition that you took of child labor in India for the purposes of this program was that the definition of child labor is any child out of school. Now, you know, I would love for you to say a little bit more about why you adopted this definition and the practical application of this as opposed to the legal definition. Aki, yeah. can you turn your camera on too, please? There you go. You can see yeah, my face. Good to talk to you. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, doctor. Yes, no, please. No, I, I think there are two or three reasons. One is, as I said, we started with forced labor. And when we withdrew a set of children from forced labor, there were quickly another set of children who joined them. So it seemed that the cycle kept repeating itself, which also meant that there were always mm. children in the labor market to fill up when children are withdrawn from work. And we felt that if you have to stop completely, you have to, in fact, be more inclusive in your definition. The second reason is, as I told you, girls were totally invisible uh, if we did not have this definition. And we found that uh, their work is so uh, undermined. They just say that, you know, uh, washing clothes, fetching water, taking care of siblings in such a monotonous fashion. It's as monotony, as much monotony, monotony as their lives are. They do that all the time till they die. And nobody mm -hmm. even thinks it's hazardous. You know, right. and so we felt if you have to be inclusive, if you have to stop forced labor, which is slavery, you must stop more number of children getting into the labor market. Secondly, if you have to be inclusive and recognize girls' work, then you will have to talk about all children out of school. Finally, if you have to set up a social norm, then it has to be an inclusive definition where we touch every poor household and and a rich household in an area. Mm. If we target and a targeted approach will not help creating a norm. A universal approach always helps in mm. creating a shock and outrage that in our area children are out of school. Mm. Children are still mm. working. You know, I think that vocabulary is so so important. A radical vocabulary is possible, not in a targeted approach, but a universal approach of rights. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shantasana. It would be wonderful, Sarah, if you could uh, come back on and uh, Venket as well. And uh, we just have about 10 minutes for some uh, broader questions. Um, Carolyn, I don't know if you wanted to offer any from the uh, questions that have come in, up in the chat box. Uh, there's, um, there's a few there. Um, Kevin, hello, in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, Kevin uh, was looking for some guidance on how to overcome the, um, the challenge of scaling this. And Kevin, maybe we can connect you and Sarah and you can have a chat um, is, is a good answer because you're both working in such a similar area. Um, Libby, hi, up in the Blue Mountains in near Sydney, also in lockdown like we are. Um, so where there's a reduction in child labour, who does the work instead, Sarah? Where there isn't a reduction, or what is the where question? There is a reduction. So when child labour reduces, who takes up the slack? Who does the rest of the work? The rest of which work? Ah, that, the, that is not done by children. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Um, uh, well, um, of course, there can be more adult uh, workers uh, doing the work um, and adult family uh, laborers. Mm. Mm. Okay, great. Yes. So ideally, it's of course paid uh, workers, uh, but it can also be um, community service groups or young adults that can offer uh, services um, within the community uh, or the cooperative. Great, great. One um, question that I just wanted to 
jump in with, Carolyn, I hope you don't mind, was that, you know, both of the speakers have been talking about, you know, a number of different stakeholders. We've, you know, the shared accountability of government, businesses, communities. Um, you know, one thing that was said is that community shouldn't do the job of government. Government shouldn't do the job of businesses. Businesses shouldn't do the job of government. Um, what do you do when there is a gap, though? You know, what do you do when there is a gap, when, you know, government aren't able to fill the capacity, when the businesses aren't doing enough? What do you do when you want to take up your, you know, your role as a stakeholder? Happy to hear from any of the speakers. Venkat, <laughs> would you come in? That is a yeah. very important question. <laughs> yeah, this is very important. Uh, uh, we faced uh, in, uh, in, in within the country, one state to another state, the different players are not playing their own roles. So that's when we uh, took our experiences from past in our uh, areas. And engaging with them is the constant engagement is one uh, mantra we found out. And uh, sometimes there will be a lot of trust deficit. It's not that they are not uh, ready, but to build the trust uh, deficit, uh, uh, that was very important in our work that uh, one has to uh, uh, build that uh, trust deficit to trust building exercises. Even with the government and, and you know, as a civil society organization, the vulnerabilities are there. So to build that with the companies and with the uh, uh, society, uh, we have to uh, work uh, constantly. Mm. That that uh, approach we. I might just add one thing that sometimes the schools are in there, so we open the school as if it is a state school. You know, and then mm. get the uh, state to take over the school. In fact, you have to be very subversive in a sense that, you know, you open a school, you have an attendance register, you do everything that the school does and gradually get the community, tell the government, put pressure on them to say, now own up the school, this is your government mm. has to pay. It, it's a process of two to three years, but it did mm. work in at least some 40 to 50 schools that we did. Mm. Where we, and that is a deficit, you know, even bridge courses. Mm. We ran the bridge course, then we got the com uh, government to put pressure on them. The, the entire social welfare department ran the bridge course for two years right. continuously. So the pressure right. is so, so important. Mm -mm. And, and right. indeed also awareness raising. I think that's in, indeed key, educating, awareness raising, and the awareness raising also to understand why actually um, a certain case is not okay why is right. child labor not okay what and what are the different nuances of child labor in which situation is it absolutely a no-go and so there are different okay. nuances to it and i think that requires a lot of awareness raising to all stakeholders in order for all stakeholders companies governments mm -hmm. communities to also understand what their own role is in in addressing that right right so this is really helpful so we've got you know, let's say you've got government, civil society and communities and businesses. Um, they're not properly talking to each other. They're not bringing up their roles. Venkat, you've said that trust is really important, bringing everybody in the room and actually starting with trust to start building that relationship. Of course, there are gaps in the short term. So those gaps need to be filled in the short term. Two to three years, you said, uh, Dr. Shanda, you know, build a school, but it has to be taken over by the state. And Sarah, you, what you've mentioned is awareness raising, because at the end of the day, will comes from understanding what the issues are. So that's that's really helpful. Um, and and this is where I think also um, this multi-stakeholder setting is in, is important. And if you look at the EU level, that's among others also what the EU is trying to do now. So there is an EU multi-stakeholder um, what do they call it now uh, initiative on um, on responsible uh, cocoa that brings together all all the actors. And once you have all the actors around the table, you can really make sure that everyone has the same understanding of the issue and that together mm. we uh, all. So understand where the gaps are and together we also agree on uh, what should be provided and there was a 
a new EU study and, and that was published just recently um, focused on the, the challenges of child labor in the cocoa sector in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana that addresses that. So to some extent, you also need, whether at national level or international level, this multi-stakeholder setting, you need to bring all actors uh, uh, around the table indeed. Otherwise, you go plick plock into different uh, approaches um, and, and it's very important to make sure that everyone is aligned and that there is dialogue and indeed also trust building. Mm -hmm. And the dialogue and the trust building is not just at that local level, because we're hearing from MV Foundation how you champion, you ch take a district and you champion you know, champion the cause from a ground upwards level. And what you're talking about, Sarah, is from an EU level, you know, very both. high level strategic, you know, both ends of a supply chain, so important. And of course, there's quite a few questions about how do you fund and different funding models, um, which I guess we could do a whole other webinar on, couldn't we, Carolyn? Yes. Um, in the last <laughs> few minutes, um, we got a few minutes left. Carolyn, did you just, I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything press, well, everything is pressing, but yeah. anything particularly. Just, just to say, uh, we're not going to get to all the questions. So yes, apologies, um, for that. However, um, please, if you do have some, still put them up. And, and what we will do is we will get written answers. And when we send out the, um, the, the filming, recording. Of the, the recording, we will give it to you. Uh, those answers. But I guess um, just in the last couple of minutes, this might be a good one um, from Lillian. Um, uh, Dr. Shanta, you talked about the development of new social norms. Um, so it's not just about changing behaviour, but it's, it's about changing the way that a culture addresses something. Mm. How do you, how do you um, ensure the sustainability of those new norms. And that might be you or then Kat, Sarah might have some input or Artie, so. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, when children become children, which means when they're not child laborers, but they're students, parents become parents. They don't uh, uh, abuse the child. If the child was a child labor, even the parents begin to abuse the child. But once they enjoy the child as a student, they begin to invest in the child. And when parents become parents, teachers become teachers, it, it, there's a built-in sustainability. Every institution begins to play its role uh, in a manner that it is sustainable. You know, you, if you only arrest children from going to work and coming to school, there is a deepening of democracy. It's inevitable. That is what we saw. You know, I, I, I'm, I, it's not abstract. You know, children are being invested in by the community. They, they take ownership. They take pride. We don't have to be there. We are not there in about 3,000 villages where there is no child labor. We've mm. abandoned those areas totally. We don't even know what's happening there. And in the secondary level data of the census of India, it is very clear that in these areas, there is no child working. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And just to one, one point to add, uh, you know, in these areas, uh, the communities become a resource, uh, resource uh, uh, organization like resource persons like. So the, the moment they started sharing their stories to other villages, other state mm. other countries then they have to be very intact with their uh, social norm because they are resource mm. uh, villages uh, giving information to others because that is the uh, self uh, discipline comes with this social norm mm. thank you thank right. you well that's come to the end of our time sadly and and uh, really once again it's been an incredibly stimulating time and uh, we, we just are getting each time, you know, into an, uh, a depth to it where the deep dive would really take us as to do. But, oh, my goodness, couldn't we have some deep fun by digging into a lot of these by really trying to work out what's going to be the ways forward. So uh, thank you so much uh, for, uh, yes. for being on here uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Shantu and uh, Venkat. Um, uh, namaste. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Sarah, thank you so much and for the input and for mapping it out in the diagram so well. So uh, merci beaucoup. And um, to all of you who are on the, uh, all of you who are on watching this and those who you watch the recording as well, uh, thank you for your interest. We hope you find this helpful. And uh, for the questions that have not been answered, we will ask the, uh, the speakers to answer those and send those out as well. So thank you, everybody. The next one thank uh, thank that you. we will be doing, thank you, is on September the 16th. September the 16th will be our next one, the fourth one in the series. Now, this one is also going to be extremely special because this one, our speakers are all children. So we're giving children yep. a voice to actually say, what do they think and what's their view? Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's going to be an absolutely tantalizing one uh, with the people that we've got lined up so far. And they are just working really, really hard to get across uh, what they want to say from their country, from their perspective, from their understanding. So that's going to be a really good one. We'll send out information to you on that September the 16th. Um, and uh, in... Uh, Australian Eastern Standard Time, it will be at uh, 8 p.m. again. And of course, that means it will be uh, 11 o'clock uh, in UK and, and uh, uh, 12 at uh, um, Geneva. Geneva time. <laughs> so you can have another uh, uh, delectable lunch, Sarah, uh, watching the next one and, and the children there uh, and others. Uh, you know your time zone that goes from there. Thank you, everybody. We really thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.